So welcome everyone to the 2014 Steenbach Lectures. And before I introduce the speaker, I just wanted to introduce Harry Steenbach, whom these lectures are named after. So Harry was a member of the biochemistry department, and one of his most notable discoveries was the finding that you could use UV light to irradiate food to enrich the food in vitamin D. And so this led to the basically cure of a lot of vitamin D-based deficiencies, uh, diseases, including rickets. And as you can see here in this picture, this is Harry carrying out an experiment, irradiating mice with a UV light. And this is actually captured on a video that you can find on YouTube. So I encourage you to look up this YouTube video and you can see Harry carrying out one of his seminal experiments. So vitamin D is referred to as the sunshine vitamin and this led to Harry getting the nickname the sun trapper. So our Steenbach lecturer today is Ron Vale, who's known for his work on molecular motors. So you can think of Ron then being as the motor trapper who's trapped molecular motors. <coughs> Excuse me. So Ron has a long-standing interest in cell motility and molecular motors. And this dates back to his time as a graduate student when he carried out a really seminal series of experiments where he identified the molecular motor kinesin which locks along microtubules. And shown in the bottom left-hand corner is an image from one of the five cell papers he published in 1985 describing this series of experiments. This work was carried out in collaboration with three other researchers, Mike Sheets, Tom Reese, and Bruce Schnapp. And the work that they did characterizing and identifying kinesin led to the opening of this whole new field of study of molecular motors. And so since this initial work, a number of other different kinesins have been identified. This is now a huge superfamily. There are 14 subfamilies. And in humans, there are 45 different kinesins that carry out a number of different essential roles within cells. So Ron has won a number of different awards, including most recently the Lasker Award in 2012. He's a member of the Cellular Molecular Pharmacology Group at UCSF where he's been a professor since 1986. He's an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And in addition to all of his scientific achievements, he's also been very involved in science outreach. So he's one of the founders of iBiology, which produces the iBio seminars. So he's very involved not only in research, but also promoting research and science research. So, Today, Ron is going to talk about his work on motor proteins, and tomorrow he'll talk about the work that his lab has recently done with T-cell receptor signaling, and this has led to the discovery of a very elegant mechanism by which the change in energy that's created when the membrane deforms leads to the activation of the receptor. So this is a really nice mechanism in and of itself, in addition to a new finding about how T-cell receptor signaling occurs. And so with that introduction, I'll now turn the stage over to Ron. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you, Jill, for the very nice invitation. I appreciate it. It's a great honor to give uh, the Steenbach uh, lectures. Uh, there are a lot of great faculty here, so I'm having a fun time visiting. And uh, I'm also very excited uh, to come here, because this is probably the maybe the only time in my life when I'm going to experience uh, minus 40 to minus 50 wind chill factor. So. Uh, I'll see what happens with that uh, this evening. Um, yes, so uh, this lecture today will be on our work with molecular motors, and um, uh, tomorrow's will be on the T cell. I mean, they both have a similar theme of, you know, I would say using uh, biochemistry and reconstitution to. Uh, dissect uh, cellular processes, so that's the one theme in common. I did want to also just start off uh, just by maybe telling you about advertising uh, uh, this other project, which is also, uh, I would say, a great passion of mine, uh, which a project which has now been uh, called iBiology. And uh, actually, it's been growing over, over years, but uh, it started maybe in 2006 when you know I just realized that uh, the way we communicate our work through oral communication, like in the form of the seminar, um, that you know there's some places like Madison and 
San Francisco and so forth, where you do have great seminar series, but uh, many other places in um, uh, the U.S. and around the world uh, really don't have access to uh, seminar speakers and don't have an opportunity to hear the work from leading scientists. So, uh, so over time that gave rise to this project where we um, uh, film scientists such as, uh, this is actually a, a recent one we did with Randy Sheckman who's actually uh, giving a, a talk here in a new series that we have which is directed for it, uh, high school students and beginning college. Um, and you know, really the mission is, is uh, just to make scientific communication in terms of oral communication available to anyone around the world. And we film these speakers uh, in a studio in a green screen, so similar the way the weatherman is being recorded. And um, uh, they are available on this site, which is called iBiology, which I encourage you to go to. There are about 100 seminars, which are similar in flavor to a seminar like this, uh, although they have a, a much longer separate introduction, which is geared for non-specialists and students. Um, I think one of the difficulties in giving a seminar like this is we, you know, we have to get to our data. We don't have enough time often to give a really proper introduction. But all these seminars have a really great extensive introduction uh, to them. The iBio Magazine series are 15-minute talks. Um, they're a little bit like what I consider the TED Talks of our profession. So they'll describe maybe um, in less than 15 minutes uh, showing how a famous Nobel laureate uh, made their kind of behind the scenes that went into their discovery. They'll be uh, talks on education, talks on careers, um, talks on what scientists do outside of the lab. Uh, it's a whole collection of very interesting talks. And a new product, which we just have come up with, which is called iBioEducation, which was launched with our new website, um, is geared to um, uh, material so that educators can use them. Uh, potentially, if you're giving talks to undergraduates here, these can be really useful supplements uh, to teaching. So. Uh, we are very eager to actually work with, um, uh, well, graduate educators too, but undergraduate educators who want to use this material. So I would encourage you to have a look and also feel free to uh, email us and we're happy to work with you. We also have, we're starting to produce courses. We have actually a complete course on light microscopy. Uh, an advanced course with about 60 videos on it. It's a really amazing resource. It's done by kind of the leaders of microscopy from all over the world and a beginning course which is about 13 lectures more for newcomers to microscopy for example an undergraduate so they're all on this is what the I just took this off of the website right now this is what the site looks like so you can navigate in these seminars these short videos and these educational resources including the microscopy course um, also, just a little bit of another advertisement. We are also trying to make this site more interactive so that you just, you know, in addition to seeing the videos, we're also starting interactive formats with scientists uh, through Google Hangout, which is very easy to do. Uh, you know, you just get on the internet, pop open your computer. Uh, the links are all present here. And on February 7th, you can listen to Bruce Alberts uh, talk about you know, future challenges of science. So we're having one of these about every month. Uh, the next one will be with Keith Yamamoto. So again, I think also for those of you who are, you know, uh, graduate students, postdocs, uh, undergraduates, this is a really great venue. They've been quite lively discussions, so I encourage you to have a look at that too. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about this project afterwards or over the next couple days. And Judith has been a big supporter of us uh, at ASCV, so thank you, Judith, uh, who's been helping us with international uh, outreach for this project. Just another little thing that may be uh, of interest, uh, which is another lab project, a community open source uh, project, is uh, software that we develop, mainly a very talented person in my group, Nico Sturman. This is open source software for microscopy. So. Um, Unlike commercial software, which is very expensive, uh, not open source, doesn't run all the equipment that you necessarily need, um, 
this software here uh, will control your cameras, your robotics, uh, everything associated with your microscope. And uh, it's completely free. Uh, it has a big user community already. And um, anyway, free, you can't argue with the price tag of that. And um, anyway, we're also ha happy to help you uh, uh, set this up in your lab as well. OK, <clears throat> so now on to the science. Um, I think one of the really fun things that I love working in this field, which is biological motion, is that everyone's familiar with motion as a very inherent property of life. Uh, of course, these are obvious muscle mo movements here. Uh, and then if you look at any pond water, even as a child, you can see all kinds of wonderful creatures swimming around in there. Um, so biology has machines that create this type of movement. And um, these are some of the well-known machines uh, and how they work. This is uh, muscle myosin. Um, if Ivan Raymond is here, a lot of this is really based upon his uh, work on the uh, crystal structure of myosin um, and the lever arm motion. Um, and uh, kinesin working, uh, moving along microtubule tracks here. Um, <clears throat> so I, what this lecture is going to be about is really focused uh, on very recent work on uh, dining. Uh, all the work I'm going to be, this is actually the first time I'm going to be talking about all the work uh, in this seminar. Uh, so fairly new, um, unpublished. Um, and um, we actually maybe switched more from kinesin to dynein about a decade ago because very little is understood about how this motor works. And I'll tell you about that later. But I want to start off um, to tell you a little bit about what we did learn from kinesin and myosin because I think it, it, it's at least our aspiration of where we want to see uh, dynein several years from now. And also might help to introduce to you what molecular motors do. So uh, molecular motors are uh, machines uh, that take chemical energy, um, in this case from the chemical energy source ATP, and they're enzymes. So they go through and do a number of chemical steps on um, this energy source, which is first uh, hydrolyze the gamma phosphate bond, and then release the phosphate. Um, and then release the ADP and then rebind ATP again. So they go through this cycle, which is called the ATP hydrolysis cycle. And during one of these cycles, uh, the motor uh, produces uh, some kind of uh, motion along a track and force associated with that motion. And um, these machines do this at much greater efficiency than uh, your automobile. Um, so in many cases, these machines work at extracting about 50 to 90% of the theoretical chemical energy and converting that into work. Um, and this just shows from the good old kinesin days, um, an example of uh, kinesin bound to a plastic bead, undergoing these cycles and moving these plastic beads along a microtubule track here. Now, again, as Jill referred to, uh, in May, it's been, been quite an amazing journey because uh, we started in 1985 just observing motion, really, in axons. And these are little vesicles, and that's a mitochondria over there, um, moving along these microtubule tracks. Really not very clear what was underneath these organelles and what they might be doing to produce this magical motion. But since that time, just through the amazing tools that have come out all around us in biology, um, you know, everything from better structural approaches, uh, single molecule, genomics, et cetera. Um, you, you know, in the kinesin world and with myosin, I think we now have a pretty good idea what these uh, machines look like and what kind of uh, structural changes happen in this protein uh, to produce the motion. So, um, uh, well, I'll get to in the next slide. Um, every time there's a chemical change in the motion that's accompanied by a structural change, in this case of kinesin, that um, uh, leads to uh, this little region called the neck linker zippering up along the main motor domain and um, positioning its partner head to a forward binding site. So 
Um, inherent in deriving that model, which is obviously an animation, uh, what one really is trying to do to understand how these machines work ultimately is first of all uh, to have a, a, a fairly sophisticated understanding of their structure, either through X-ray or EM. Um, but the challenge then is not just to get one static structure, but to piece together uh, different states of that protein, uh, particularly what those states are during this ATPA cycle to derive a model uh, for how this protein uh, could create motion. So I, I think this is kind of a, an apt analogy. I mean, this is similar to what uh, people were um, uh, debating at the end of the 19th century of how a horse actually runs, and it was unknown even whether it had all of its legs on the ground at one time or whether, you know, uh, how, how the horse uh, could actually gallop. And that was done through high-speed photography where they could capture different states of that horse and then derive, if you'd like, uh, a, a pretty good understanding of the cycle of how these legs are moving to propel the horse. And in some ways, that's kind of what we're trying to do with these motors, is also to derive a number of different states and piece together um, how this chemical cycle gets converted into protein structural changes that lead to motion. Um, so, uh, Again, I'll say a few words about kinesin and myosin before transiting to dynein. But uh, in this case, uh, and there I, I see Ivan in the audience here, but uh, we actually were helped considerably by his earlier work on myosin because we had an, a real surprise, and I would say in this case a helpful surprise, that uh, when we got the crystal structure for kinesin with uh, Robert Flederick, what we found um, is even though kinesin is a microtubule motor and myosin is an actin motor and they're completely different sizes, they actually appear to have evolved from a common ancestor. And what you see in blue is a common and probably very ancient uh, structural core for both of these motors um, that actually overlaps very nicely um, if you superimpose them. And uh, if I have to summarize how these motors work in a nutshell, which is obviously leaving out a lot of details, is what these proteins have evolved and actually still share in common as a similar common strategy for movement is they have this core structure featured in blue which is uh, performing the chemistry. Uh, performing the chemistry and also um, acting as a switch to uh, trigger structural changes in the protein. So this is a core that will hydrolyze the ATP and it has some uh, regions of that protein that change state very subtly depending upon whether there's an ATP in the binding site or whether there's an ADP in the binding site. And in fact, those sensors, if you like, are quite similar between kinesin and myosin. So the common chemistry and sensing of the nucleotide is very similar. And then that has to be, that information that's happening right around the nucleotide has to be communicated to other parts of the protein. Again, amazingly, kinesin and myosin use a very similar strategy of a helix here, uh, which is either called a switch two or relay helix, that extends from one end um, where the nucleotide is to another end, uh, which is where a mechanical element is. In the case of kinesin and myosin, there are very different mechanical elements that the two have evolved. But uh, the helix is a common mechanism for communicating information. When something happens here at the nucleotide, this mechanical element also changes. Um, yeah, so that's our green helix over there. These are our mechanical elements. And these are the state changes that happen in these mechanical elements. Again. Uh, uh, work from Ivan and well as many other people have defined this lever arm movement of myosin and kinesin also undergoes a state change of this lever arm. Um, so you have this amplification mechanism that converts very small changes that are happening in the nucleotide binding site into much bigger scale motions of another domain of the protein. And um, you know that's what is causing this um, state change of this 
a uh, little element here called the neck link of kinesin where it zippers up and propels the partner head forward. And uh, of course, this is an animation, but you can actually put fluorescent probes on the motor domain to measure the state of the neck linker. So we think it's not completely made up. But uh, this is actually a kinesin that's walking along a track. And I'm not going to go into the details of that experiment. Uh, but this is a FRET experiment. So when you see it being bright over here, uh, this neck linker is in this red conformation. But then it switches to yellow where it's in this yellow conformation. And you can see it altering back and forth as this motor is walking along the track, such as here. OK, the other thing you should know, also know about motors is that they're not on all the time. And that kind of makes sense. You don't want the motor to be churning up energy all the time. You want it to be uh, harnessing energy when it's doing something productive, like moving a cargo. So for example, uh, kinesin, uh, there's a lot of kinesin in the cytoplasm and cells. Thank goodness, otherwise I never would have had a chance to purify it. In fact, uh, actually the real story is, you know, we and probably everyone else in the field thought if there was a motor, it was going to be either bound to the organelle uh, or it might be bound to the microtubule, but no one was expecting it to be floating around in the cytoplasm. Um, but there's a ton of it in the cytoplasm, and most of it's in this inactive folded state. Cargo comes along and it activates it. And so each motor has some kind of mechanism that can switch its state from one to another. OK, so that's my intro here. Now let me get on uh, to the dynein molecule and tell you something about it. So why has, so dynein has lagged behind kinesin and myosin. And maybe this slide explains why. Uh, it's very, very large. It's about uh, um, one and a half megadaltons in terms of the complete holoenzyme. Um, so it's very complex. Uh, system to study uh, and dissect what everything's doing. But it contains this uh, ring-shaped motor domain um, that I'll describe in more detail. And then it has a what's called a tail domain with many associated subunits that dock dynein onto different kinds of cargos in the cell. And so dynein um, is very important. It's what uh, causes your um, cilia to beat, for example, in your uh, uh, Ep, um, bronchial tracts, uh, or it will cause um, sperm to swim, or cilia in a paramecium to move. Um, it has many roles in my uh, in in um, just interface cells. It's the major uh, motor protein that moves to the minus end of microtubule. So that's mostly in most cells transported from the cell periphery to the center, and kinesins move in the opposite direction. They move. It moves organelles, uh, protein complexes, mRNAs, just a, a, a tremendous amount of different cargos. And it's also involved in building the mitotic spindle and also um, involved in uh, activities at the kinetochore as well. So pretty important class of motor protein, as Jill would agree to. Um, so the two things I'd like to talk to you about today are, first of all, how does this motor domain work? And uh, second, uh, last part, I'll talk about how this motor protein might be regulated. So um, we began studying maybe around 2000. And dynein was a, a graveyard uh, for the first couple people <laughs> that attempted to work on this in my laboratory. Um, but then I was very fortunate to have Sam Rec Peterson uh, come along to set up um, Cerevisiae as a model system where um, uh, we can uh, modify the gene by homologous recombination, so begin to put probes on it or manipulate the dynein recombinantly, um, which was critical for all the success we had with kinesin. She also got uh, in vitro motility assays working from this. And Shortly after, a few other postdocs came to the lab, and that's a single molecule assay for dynein. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Carter, very talented uh, protein chemist, uh, worked out a whole bunch of uh, protein biochemistry of, of uh, dynein, including the crystallization that I'll describe to you. 
Ahmed Yaldiz was a physicist and got uh, high resolution tracking information about how dining uh, steps along the track. And uh, Arna Genrich um, uh, developed an understanding of how dining produces force and responds to different force. The reason I want to show this slide is it's also, I think, a good example, I think, for students or postdocs. All these folks had to come to the lab, and we couldn't get anything to work with dining in the beginning. So they all had to work together to get these various assays uh, uh, to work. And it was really critical that they work together in the beginning. And sometimes people are worried, oh, if I work with someone else, will I ever get a job? So anyway, uh, they did OK in the end. Um, and they're all great scientists and now starting their own labs. So you could also, someone may say, well, of course, you worked on the kinesin mechanism for so long, and dining is just another, it's another microtubule motor, probably work like kinesin. Wrong. Uh, because even though they work on a microtubule, uh, dining really has nothing to do with kinesin, evolutionarily, or, and there are probably going to be tons of differences in the mechanism. This is just a gross oversimplification, so don't take any of these distances very seriously. I just made up in keynote. Uh, <clears throat> but as I told you about, mice and kinesin evolved from a common ancestor. Um, they're, they're related to small GTPases as well. Uh, but dynein has evolved from a com maybe originally from something that had a, a common motif in many nucleotidases called a PLU. But it has emerged from a whole other group of enzymes that are called AAA ATPases. Um, and in reality, dynein is kind of the weird uncle in this protein family uh, because most of them are actually uh, unfoldases. Uh, they unfold proteins um, for uh, degradation. So this is a, a system in bacteria. Uh, this is a AAA protein um, called CLIP-A or CLIP-X that takes proteins, unfolds them, and stuffs them into a degradation chamber. The top of the proteasome is also made up of AAA ATPases. Uh, uh, Jim Rothman also worked on a factor called um, uh, NSF, which is a AAA ATPase that breaks apart snare complexes. So many of these proteins use ATP energy to pr produce work, but not to walk along a track. So dynein is the one unusual group in this family that has evolved an ability to walk along a cytoskeletal track. Um, but probably, you know, we learned a lot by comparison, comparing kinesin and myosin. I think we're going to learn more from, about dynein by comparing it to unfoldases than we will by comparing it to kinesin, for example. So let me give you now a little bit of primer on what these AAA ATPases are and what they do. Um, they all have this common structure of uh, two domains. Um, a large domain, uh, which is a beta sheet and surrounding alpha helices, and a small helical subdomain. Um, the majority of them are expressed as a single gene product that self-assembles into a hexameric uh, oligomer. Um, so the majority of these are hexamers, but they originate by self-assembly. They also depend upon one another. So the neighbors depend upon one another for hydrolyzing ATP. So for example, there is a critical arginine, which is called the arginine finger, from a neighboring subunit that is part of the active site of uh, the ATPase. So uh, that's why you need these oligomers to get efficient ATP hydrolysis because they depend upon their neighbor. So dynein is also the weird uncle in the sense that it has concatenated a hexamer of AAA domains in one polypeptide into one of the biggest polypeptides in the genome. Um, as a result of that, unlike most AAA ATPases, which have the same subunit around the ring, each of these AAA domains in dynein is different. They evolve different sequences, so no, none of these are identical to one another. Um, four of them, uh, what's called AAA 1, 2, 3, and 4, which has a big insertion into it, which binds to the microtubule that I'll show you, these all bind ATP. 
Uh, the last two do not. They've lost that ability, but they're probably needed to uh, structurally complete the, the ring. Um, so it, dynein also has two big uh, features that interact with the ring, which I'll talk about. One is the stock domain, and the other is something that's called the linker, which I'll explain later. Now, this also puts in perspective uh, uh, why dynein has not been easy to study because it, it is so large. This is just the motor domain. Uh, and this puts it in relative perspective uh, to kinesin, for example. So it's a real behemoth of a motor. Um, but it also, just from looking at this structure, you could see how fascinating this motor protein is. Uh, this is the main nucleotide hydrolysis site called AAA1. And for a motor to walk, just like I'm walking, I have to get my feet off of the track. So I have to communicate from my brain to my feet to sometimes plant, sometimes release my foot. And the same thing has to happen with the motor. So sometimes they have to be tightly bound so they can produce force. But also this uh, microtubule binding part has to release so it can walk along the track. And that has to be coordinated. So events that are happening at this ATPA site have to be transmitted through this ring all the way down to change the affinity of the microtubule binding site so it can release. So this is about uh, you know, 35 uh, nanometers or so. So it's a really fascinating question of long distance transport. We actually think we have some idea what's happening with this. I'm not going to talk about that today, but happen to answer any questions. So uh, anyway, fascinating problem of, of allosteric communication and dining. The other thing that's very interesting about dynein, unlike kinesin or myosin, is it has several uh, ATP binding sites. Um, and this just shows data from Kahn and Suto a number of years ago where they prevented hydrolysis for each of these binding sites. And you can see that this AAA1 is absolutely essential. Uh, you knock it, you block hydrolysis, the motor doesn't move at all. And there's a second site here, AAA3, where if you knock it down, it also is a severe, very severe defect. Uh, these two are less important. In fact, actually, we know now that AAA2 doesn't even hydrolyze ATP. So this is going to be a subject of this talk, uh, which is what these different roles of these ATP aces are in dining. And uh, I don't think we have the entire answer, but I think we made possible some insights into that question. Now, the last thing about dynein is how does it produce mechanical force? Well, here's the ongoing model for that, which is very nice work done by Stan Burgess, Anthony Roberts, uh, Suto collaborators. But in addition to this ring here, there's this really big appendage. This is actually a cryo-EM image over here that's been stylized. But, uh, there's an appendage that sits on top of the ring called the linker. And just like you saw the myosin lever arm rotate, this linker is thought to become undocked from uh, and kind of swing out. Um, and when it goes from this state back to this state, it's thought to pull the cargo with it. So that seems to be a plausible, uh, although I would say not completely proven, but a pretty reasonable model that I think we would also agree with. So uh, a big challenge re really with dining was to get it to the modern age where uh, we can now think of it as a real structure rather than a Macintosh drawing. So that means getting um, a crystal structure for the motor. So uh, that was done by uh, a very, two very talented people, uh, Andrew Carter who I mentioned now is at LMB, and Carol Cho is a graduate student, uh, who worked together and uh, crystallized a, um, actually a GST dimer of uh, the yeast motor domain, uh, uh, originally at lower resolution and uh, pushed later by Andrew uh, Carter to, to higher uh, resolution where the side chains were visible. But, even from this first crystal structure, we could really understand the, the domain organization of how all of these uh, um, different domains um, uh, worked and interacted uh, in the dining motor. Um, and one of the big surprises from that first crystal structure is that 
the ring was not a symmetrical ring like a lot of AAA ATP aces. And in fact, uh, it was highly asymmetrical. And there were, if we just looked at what I called the large domains, which is the main ATP binding site, if we just strip those out, you could see how that it's discontinuous. Uh, there's a big gap here between AAA1 and 2, and also a gap between 5 and 6. Now this was really surprising, because I, I mentioned that the neighbor has to provide a, a, a residue that tickles the other one to hydrolyze ATP. And we knew this is the major hydrolytic site of dynein. And there's no way in this crystal structure this is going to hydrolyze ATP. So um, we reasoned, or Mott made a model, that what has to happen in the next phase, somewhere in the next phase of the cycle, is that this gap has to close um, to bring these two domains together, and that might induce a set of conformational changes that would produce that conformational change of the neck linker. So that was something that we got out of the first crystal structure. I, I should then say then, um, work uh, from uh, Khan and colleagues in Japan got a uh, very nice uh, high resolution structure of the dictostelium dynein motor domain in an ADP pound state. The last state I showed you was uh, nucleotide free. So we now had two different crystal states of um, ADP and no nucleotide free, uh, a little problematic because we're also from two very different species. Um, but it was pretty clear, you know, we had to keep going. We had to really get uh, more snapshots to try to understand uh, what dynein is doing in its cycle. So uh, again, a very fortunate, uh, again, to have people with the right skills and personalities who are willing to work together. So uh, Gira Baba um, and Wei Chun have been working very closely together to try to understand new structural states of dynein. Um, uh, they've been uh, great partners, and Gira's focused more on EAM, and Wei Chun has worked on um, uh, X-ray crystallography, and I think you'll see how the two have been very complementary to one another. So um, what uh, Wei Chun was able to get was a crystal structure now of the dynein motor domain with a non-hydrolyzable ATP analog, which is AMP, PMP, um, bound uh, to the four active sites of dynein. So, uh, we can see now, uh, instead of being nucleotide free, we'd see the uh, structures for AMP, PMP in the four binding pockets. And um, well, gratifyingly, there was a structural change if we compare it to our previous crystal structure. And here we're looking on the ring uh, on a side-on view, uh, and there's the linker that's coming across. And you can see that there's a really massive change in the ring where uh, upon ATP, AMP, PMP binding, the whole ring shifts up uh, one side of the ring to become much more planar than in the nucleotide free state. Interestingly, this conformational change is restricted to one side of the ring. So from pretty much from AAA1 through 4. If we flip the ring over now and look on the other side, we see uh, that there's virtually no structural change on the other side of the ring. So half the ring is basically coming up uh, like that when ATP binds. So we can now look at the f at, uh, and try to analyze how this large conformational change is happening by looking at each of the AAA domains to see where the motions are occurring. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, so this, um, we speculated before that this gap would close. And in AAA1, and indeed, gratifyingly, it does. You could see the, the uh, blue triple, light blue AAA2 uh, move uh, like a clamshell to close uh, when there's AMP, PMP uh, uh, bound in the active site. I should say right now uh, that this state, if you look at it in detail, is still not competent for um, a catalytic reaction because the arginine is not in the right spot. And I'll come back to that later because it's a key point. Um, but if we analyze all the domains separately, you can now see uh, gray is the APO structure and the colored one is our new AMP PMP structure. You can see, as I just showed you, gray to um, uh, light blue, this clamshell motion. 
If we look at what's happening in AAA2, there's basically nothing going on here. Um, but if we compare, uh, we look at AAA3, you can see a clamshell motion also occurring between uh, 3 and 4. That's this motion and nothing happening between 4 and 5. So AMPPMP binding is clearly having actions going on here, both at at uh, AAA1 and AAA3. And I, I told you those are the two most important sites for motility in this enzyme. But in a way, the structure was disappointing. Although not really very disappointing. But um, we were speculating from what everyone was thinking in the field that when, when ATP bound to, to AAA1 that we would see a large conformational change of this linker and that this ADP vanadate was supposed to be mimicking an ATP-like state. But when we put in a non-hydrolyzable analog, we did not see that structural change of the linker. I showed you that linker was still in the exact same position. And there it is. It's crossing over the ring, looking very much like this. It basically did not change state very much at all between APO and AMPPMP. I'll come back to that, why that is. So we then uh, began by EM, because we could screen through many more conditions, so Gira did this. Um, and she now um, actually created a mutation in AAA1, where instead of putting in AMP, PMP, we can now put in real bona fide ATP. But we made a mutation, uh, a point mutation, in the active site so it couldn't hydrolyze it. So we can get ATP in there, but it wouldn't be hydrolyzed. And uh, when we did this, we actually then saw this uh, big linker swing with ATP, which uh, we didn't see with AMPPMP, as I'll show you in a second, also by EM. I should say, when you do uh, single particle uh, reconstructions, also a nice thing that you don't get from X-ray is you can um, form class averages. So you can see if there are different structures of the dynein in your population. And indeed, actually, with this ATP state and this hydrolysis mutant, we see actually different conformations of the neck linker, suggesting it's not in a single state, but probably quite flexible and able to probe different states uh, along the ring. So, uh, and as I just said, if we feed this thing uh, um, ATP, we saw that linker swing. If we fed it AMP, PMP, we didn't. Um, so there was one way to interpret that, that, well, actually this is the way we're thinking for a long time, that AMPPMP is just a bad analog for ATP. It's not ATP, you know, it uh, has a different chemical structure, so it's just not mimicking this. Until uh, we began to think of the other nucleotide binding site, which is uh, AAA3, which I also told you was important for movement. And, um, we thought that this scenario might be happening, that um, when you, when you uh, give the dynamic motor AMP, PMP, in this case, you would have AMP, PMP, a non-hydrolyzable analog bound at both sites. So you'd have an ATP-like molecule in both sites. But when you feed it ATP here, yes, you have the ATP analog in, uh, or real ATP in AAA1, but AAA3 can do chemistry on it and convert it to an ADP state. So maybe what we're seeing, the difference here is not really due to, you know, real ATP versus bad ATP, but the ability of AAA3, the second nucleotide binding site, to get in a different nucleotide state. And the answer to that is true because uh, Gira then could now make the a mutation that blocks nucleotide hydrolysis in AAA3. Um, and indeed, this is what happens. So this is just the same uh, image I showed you before. This is when you have the mutation AAA1, but AAA3 can still hydrolyze nucleotide. Now we make the double mutant where, uh, same as this, but now we prevented nucleotide hydrolysis in site 3, and this linker swing doesn't occur. Um, uh, so uh, this is what I'm going to try and uh, get through in a couple of minutes because I realize we're running out of time. But 
This gives us, I think, a new view of why you have multiple nucleotide binding sites in dynein. And that one of the nucleotide binding sites, which is AAA3, its job is actually acting as a regulatory gate. And I will say in advance that we don't know completely how that gate and how that regulation is used, it, but we think it may be used for turning dynein on and off in important situations for a cell biological function. But here's how we think the gate works. Basically, um, if you load up uh, ATP in both sides here, the dynein is, is frozen. It's mechanically inactive. Uh, but it's almost like spring-loaded. It's ready to change its conformation. But you have to hydrolyze AAA, uh, the nucleotide at AAA3. That gate opens, and now that linker swing can occur. And um, so we're beginning to think of a dynein cycle like this. If we start off with nucleotide-free dynein, um, we bind ATP uh, to these two critical sites. Uh, but the linker, and there's this big conformational change that's happened in one half of the ring, nothing that's happened on the other side of the ring, as I just showed you. Um, so we've got half of the conformational change to occur, but not the other half. And the next step, we need that gate to open, which is basically AAA3 hydrolyzing uh, the ATP, and that allows essentially the conformational change to propagate throughout the entire ring that leads to uh, this bending of the linker. Um, and that is the pre-power stroke state. And we think that then when this uh, AAA1 hydrolyzes uh, nucleotide, releases phosphate, then this linker straightens out again, and that is the power stroke. Um, and then eventually uh, it gets into another state where uh, the, uh, these two domains can open up again and release the ADP. And the interesting thing uh, that we don't know the answer to is how the cycle will continue from here. I bet it's not going to be necessary for AAA3 to cycle on every mechanical event. I think it's going to act more like a gate, and the gate's going to be open i.e. it's going to retain ADP in the active site, and it's going to go right back to this state over here. Um, but if this releases and binds ATP, it's going to go into this off state until AAA3 can hydrolyze. So, um, so anyway, and this just shows actually some of the structural changes that we think are happening. Uh, I'm going to wait for the cycle again. What you're going to see it is it going from the APO state to the AMPP bound state to a state from the Japanese group, which we think actually is a close mimic of this state. So here it is. Here's our AMPP and P conformational change. Nothing's happening on this side of the ring. But then when AAA3 hydrolyzes, you can see this um, conformational change propagating right here around the other side of the ring which we think is a, is a prelude um, to getting the mechanical swing of the motor. Um, I'll, I think I'll just skip that. So, OK, so now I'd like to shift gears the last few minutes uh, to, well, I told you a story of how we think the part of the nucleotide can actually regulate uh, turning dynein on and off. But we also know that there are a lot of other factors in the cell whose job is to regulate dynein motility. And I'll tell you another uh, story from Rick McKenney, who's a very talented postdoc who I think has put together a beautiful story on how some other dynein regulation can work. So um, it's known through uh, cell bio many years of cell biology that um, in most cells, dynein does not work alone. It works with a very large protein complex uh, called dynactin. So if you make a dynein knockout or a dynactin knockout, you get very similar phenotypes, uh, which is loss of dynein motility of some particular cargo. But really, the details of how dynein works with dynactin works with dynein still not very clear. We actually did some work on that many years ago, too. And other groups have. And they found like modest effects on how maybe how long dynein can walk along a microtubule. But nothing of the magnitude that I'm going to show you right now. So 
this story began when Rick actually um, tried to switch our lab from yeast, where we've been very comfortable and happy, to making dynein uh, from other sources, like human dynein, which he tried to make recombinantly. He also tried to get in vitro motility assays to work with purified native dynein from um, brain. Uh, and nothing he could do could uh, get the dynein to work very well. So I showed you those movies of yeast dynein moving so beautifully, but he would mostly get dynein molecules that would bind and just jiggle around, and they wouldn't engage in really good processive motion. And you can follow this in what's called a chymograph, where you're looking at the position of dynein on a microtubule over time. So if it's in the same position, you get a straight line. If it's changing its position like this, uh, it's moving along the microtubule. And the bottom line is most of the dynein's weren't moving, and if he got some to move, they were moving incredibly slowly. So it was really terrible. Uh, really couldn't do very much with this. So Rick began to you know, think through that uh, you know, maybe there's an activator in the system. And in addition to dynactin, it's also very well known, actually from genetic screens originally done by uh, Wieschhausen, Nusslen, Volhard, of another protein called BIC-D that somehow seems to be involved in dynein uh, motility. Um, and the uh, recent work, actually, by um, another group in the Netherlands, Splinter et al., actually showed that if you add BIC-D, you could form a very stable complex uh, biochemically between dynein, dynactin, and BIC-D. So it's cemented into a very stable complex. And Rick then asked, oh, well, what are, what's the motility properties of this complex? Uh, and the gratifying news is dynein, when it was complexed with both Big D and dynactin, became ultra processive. So, you know, compare that to the last video that I showed you. And in fact, uh, really, this dynactin complex is probably the most processive motor uh, ever. I mean, that we've ever studied in the lab, or maybe more processive than any motor uh, currently characterized. Um, the run lengths, these run lengths you can see here extend for very long distances and you can measure the run lengths and in many cases they're limited by the microtubule length but they're often like 15, 20 microns in length which is very many, considering the step is 8 nanometers, these are many steps. Um, so we now start getting incredible run lengths. Um, and then Rick did another experiment where he wanted to actually visualize to really make sure that last experiment I showed you, what we were actually visualizing was not dynein, but, but the adapter protein, Big D. So Rick did another experiment where he actually functionally labeled dynein, dynactin, and Big D uh, with separate fluorophores by expressing a tag subunits in mammalian cells. And also in this experiment, he could separate also dynein and dynactin from the big D to make sure that the big D is really essential for motion and joining this complex together. And the bottom line is if he added dynein and dynactin alone, it, the movement was terrible. So this is a, the, what he isolated from the mammalian cells. The dynein would stick, but it wouldn't move. Dynactin didn't even bind. And to the same tube, he adds back Dynac, Big D, and gets these really long processive runs. And these are, this is a three color image where I guess you're seeing dynein uh, in green, Big D in blue, and dynactin in red. They're separated, they're not co localizing because the microscope takes one image, uh, changes filters, takes the other image, changes filters. So there's a little time delay. Uh, so that's why they're not co-localizing, but you can see them actually mu moving beautifully at a single molecule level as this big D dynactin um, uh, triple labeled complex. Um, and we can see this complex by EM, uh, which Rick did with Gira. And it looks like from this EM, this little filament here is a short actin filament, which is part of dynactin. And you can see that it binds to the dynein tail domain over here. Here you can see the heads, there's the dynactin heads, there's the dynactin. 
Uh, it also seems to be very flexible. So it appears that this dynactin can move in many orientations relative to the dynein. And uh, the working model, uh, which Rick is uh, now working on now, oh, well, of course, we want to find the mechanism. And uh, I'll just tell you, and so far experiments might be looking promising in this direction, is that um, the dynactin is providing some kind of tether that's uh, somehow uh, linking dynein more strongly to the microtubule uh, and assisting its movement uh, through an attachment to the microtubule binding domain. But, uh, uh, sorry, attachment directly to the microtubule in some complex that may look like this, but that's uh, still work in progress. So, um, anyway, um, I want to thank all the, I'm here giving the t talk, but it's these people that did uh, all, all the fantastic work, and I've been very fortunate, uh, uh, you know, they had the privilege of having these extremely talented people in uh, our laboratory, um, Gira Baba and Wei Chan did all the structural work that I, I told you about, Rick McKinney uh, working on the big D regulation. And I also want to uh, thank our EM uh, collaborators who have helped Gira uh, in many stages of this project, uh, Yifen Chang and Malfu Lau from UCSF and uh, Arna Moller from um, uh, Scripps. And uh, thank all of you for your attention. All right, so there's one over there, but. Uh, yeah, so I wasn't quite getting how the structural changes uh, are transmitted to the contacts of the microtubule. Oh, uh, no, I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, yeah, because it's almost like a completely separate story. Uh, <laughs> but, well, you know, the bottom line is we don't entirely know the answer to that. But um, uh, let's see if I find an appropriate slide. Um, well, maybe this, this is not entirely the answer to that. Oh, no, I actually do have one. So the question is, how, does things, how do things get communicated to the uh, microtubule binding domain? So I mean, basically what we could see here is a very long coil-coil. Um, uh, and I think most of the time people think of as coil coil as, as a really dumb structure. Uh, uh, you know, it dimerizes things, but it doesn't have any intelligent life onto its own. Um, but the current model in the field is that these two helices may slide relative to one another. And the design of the coil coil is kind of interesting because one of the coil, one of the um, uh, one of the helices, coil usually has uh, two hydro, has a heptad repeat, so seven uh, residues. One and then two of the residues of the seven are hydrophobic or in, in the interior of the interacting helices. So that forms the core of the quo coil. So one of the one of the helices has a very canonical, what's called A plus D hydrophobic pattern all the way through it. The second one has effectively uh, one good hydrophobic residue in the heptad, and the second one is very weak all throughout the entire length. So one idea is that, in fact, the, these two um, helices may, um, if there is tension placed on them, could potentially slip relative to one another. Um, and if they slide by four residues, that would be a way of transmitting information all the way down this long structure to change, tweak something at the microtubule binding domain. Um, the evidence for that is we worked with Ian Gibbons many years ago, uh, who was the discoverer of dynein, and with him, uh, this is largely Ian's work, made two different versions, like froze the coil coil in these two different registries. So it took the microtubule binding domain and the two helices and froze it in like registry one or registry two. And the result was that the microtubule binding affinity at the end was altered. 
The other evidence is uh, that same group in Japan put cross-linkers in, in registry, so two cysteines that should cross-link in registry one or registry two, and they could cross-link the dynein, um, and the result was that also changed the microtubule affinity and the ATPase properties in the intact dynein. Um, now, no one's actually observed this thing sliding in a real dynein molecule, but that's the idea. But also the other interesting thing that came out of even the first crystal structure, this thing is now dead, but there was that long stalk, or they call it the stalk, that goes to the microtubule binding domain, but we found in addition to that, there's a second coil coil, and that's called the buttress over there. And it cements halfway up the other coil coil through a bunch of hydrophobic interactions. So without, I can't tell you any details of exactly how this works, but I think while these um, AAA proteins are moving around, as I showed you, they are moving around, um, then they are going to be yanking on this buttress and stalk. So if they're moving around on the base and the buttress and stalk are moving, but they're connected at one fixed point where they're both interacting, then you could possibly pull the helices through the movements of the ring, uh, which would get converted through some sliding of these helices that would then get converted to some probably subtle domain changes that are happening in that microtubule binding domain. So uh, it's kind of maybe this really complicated Rube Goldberg kind of string of events. But Anyway, we think there's something happening to these helices and that this connection between the buttress and the stalk is a way of communicating things that are happening in the ring to linear motions that are happening with these helices. Details to be figured out. Yeah. Well, that, well, the concentrations are really very, very low. Uh, uh, so we're looking at single molecules. I mean, it's a good question, but the EM shows uh, that we see single particles, so they don't look like multimers. And also, if we measure the fluorescent intensity, it's, again, most consistent with one copy of Big D, dynein, and dynactin, and they're not forming some kind of multimers. So it looks like it's working by you know, a, a single stoichiometric complex. As I said, the reason in that experiment why they look shifted is that this dynein is actually moving really fast. So uh, every, in that experiment, if we have full ATP there, then every time we switch filters, the dynein has already moved along the microtubule. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've been, I'm trying to think if we can actually answer that definitively. We've had trouble actually separating dynein and dynactin with great purity of separation. So um, e even, in, even in things where we've uh, tried to separate like native dynein to a dynein and a dynactin fraction, um, uh, that looks pretty clean on a gel. Uh, by the single molecule experiment, any small contamination of dynactin gets hooked up to Big D and, and dynein. Um, so we see even a minor, minor population of dynactin in a dynein prep getting recruited to dynein. So as of yet, we haven't been able to get a completely pure dynein prep with absolutely no dynactin in it that we've added big D to. It's one of the things about the single molecule experiment. You can observe like a 1% contaminant very, very easily in those kinds of experiments. Um, so yeah, maybe at current stage the answer is no. But I, I um, strongly uh, suspect that big D uh, plus dynein alone is not going to be processive. Also, the work, very nice work by Splinter et al., again showed that 
in their biochemistry, Big D, uh, that the Big D did not interact with dynact dynein very well unless there was dynactin. So the, they seem to synergize in forming this complex together. But it's a good question. Yeah. So in the case of the human dynein, when it's not moving, is it still hydrolyzing ATP and just remaining stationary, or is it the ATP cycle fixed as well? Yeah, it looks like it looks like still hydrolyzing ATP. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing about dynein in general, it's a very poorly regulated ATPase overall compared to myosin and kinesin. So kinesin and myosin have a very high activation of their ATPases by the polymers, like, you know, 500 fold or something. Dynein, if you look at it with or without microtubules, it's uh, fairly minor. I mean, usually like eight fold. Um, so it's not uh, extremely tightly coupled ATPase. Looks like it's there to help generate heat in the body during cold days. <laughs> you check to see, you know, maybe just the ATP free site is more strongly coupled than the other guys. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, part of the problem is it's really hard to develop when you're measuring ATPase. You don't know where that ATP is coming from, and it's hard to make conclusions completely from mutants, like, oh, I made a mutant here, and therefore everything I see left is here, because these two sites may be talking to one another. So that's something we're interested in doing in the future, is making probably some fluorescent probes that could distinguish um, you know, the chemical cycles in the different sites. Uh, but right now, we don't have the answer to that. So I, I think that's a very important thing to do. Um, yeah, so the question is, how does the communication around the ring go? Um, well, the, the arginine finger is probably essential for catalysis. Uh, we don't know how important it is for the conformational change mechanism. But, for example, that big movement that you saw over there, probably not dependent on the arginine finger because it's not really, it looks like it's not engaged in anything. Um, you know, basically I think that um, the, um, what it looks like is the conformational change starts at AAA1. That's where the biggest movement occurs. It kind of, uh, it brings along with it many of the adjacent subunits. And then interestingly, the linker spans over, spans over the ring. So it starts at AAA1, and it docks at AAA5. And in our AMP-PMP structure, it's actually making physical contact with the ring on the other side. And I think that's important for blocking, because you've got now cemented like the ring at one point, and you cemented the ring on the other point. And that is probably what's blocking the conformational change from propagating around subunits on the far side of the ring. So I think what has to happen is that linker has to pop off, and then you can get that second phase of movements that I showed you in that morphed diagram. So I think what's happening is a AAA3 hydrolysis somehow is popping the linker off of the ring, and that allows the dominoes to keep going. So I kind of use this, you know, in a, by analogy, like imagine you have a string of dominoes, right? And um, you start the first domino going, and it, it goes click, 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 and knocks down, you know, one, two, and three, but you're holding your finger on the third domino. And that's what I think the, uh, ATP in AAA3 is doing. It's kind of holding the finger down on that domino. Once that hydrolyzes to phosphate, phosphate comes out, it's like that finger releases, and the, the dominoes can keep propagating around the ring. So that's kind of a visual graphic description of how I think you know, that conformational change is going and what the role of AAA3 is doing. 
And part of that domino effect going around, like I said, is probably to pop that linker off, um, uh, which is freezing. It's kind of connecting the two parts of the ring together so they can't move. So unless you get that linker off, you know, you don't have the freedom of movement anymore. Yes? In the case of the cilium, the dinings are between the yeah, the t yeah. one and the sphinx, and the other yeah. and You're right. So in that case, the ring and the sphinx on one side? So in that case, uh, one of the, the tail domain that I showed you that had all those other subunits, it's a different dining than one. This is what is called cytoplasmic dining. But the concept is, is kind of similar. So instead of, like normally, you attach the tail to a, a cargo. And when dynein walks, it can carry the cargo along the microtubule. In the case of the cilium, the tail domain of the dynein is attached to one of the uh, pairs of the microtubule. And it's locked in there tightly. And the modal domains are attaching to the partner microtubule. And what happens with that is one microtubule slides relative to the other. And that was actually beautifully shown by Ian Gibbons many, many years ago, where they could isolate the axoneme, kind of proteolize connections that are holding the axoneme together. And when they started activating the dynein, instead of getting beating, they just got microtubule sliding. So one of the dyneins would just push out the partner microtubule outside of the axony. The big mystery is how you convert sliding motion, which is what dynein normally would like to do. It's just pushing things uh, into a waveform. So that motion between these microtubules that are sliding relative to one another is somehow regulated in a way that dynein's on one side of the axoneme are turned on, the other ones are off, and then they go back and forth. So there's some really interesting and complicated regulation that's converting a simple linear motion into a, a, a beating kind of motility.